environmental stewardship has been on the rise. As people want to know more about their actions, the consequences of their actions, and what impact this will have on the environment, LCA is the natural tool, the natural direction to go to give us these answers. Uh, we used ISO 1440 and ISO 1444, developed by the International Organization for Standardization, as they offer guidelines for the completion of any LCA study. So combining what we know about a resource and its life cycle, including material and energy inputs and outputs, we can find out the emissions in three different categories, air, land, and water. Emissions by themselves, however, don't mean very much. Does anybody care if we put four billion moles of hydrogen ions into an environment? Does that make any difference at all? LCA aims to make these results meaningful by assigning real impacts to each impact category. For example, hydrogen ions in fact lead to acidification, which destroys plant and animal life, and that is something that does matter. An additional benefit of LCA is that it makes future studies easier and more meaningful. Suppose we conduct an LCA on a steel beam. Future studies that include that steel beam are now easier to complete, and alternatives of the steel beam now have something to compare themselves to in terms of environmental performance. So the scope of our study. We performed the study on three Olympic venues. We looked at the buildings from cradle to gate, meaning that we considered manufacturing and construction, but we left out the operating energy, the maintenance costs, and the end of life impacts. We considered the structure and envelope of the building, the key components, the finishing was left out. And finally, the, um, sorry, the boundaries were, these boundaries up here were chosen based on information and time constraints basically what was available and how many hours did we have to complete the task. Who is LCA for? A better question is who isn't LCA for? <laughs> we, first of all, primarily as Rob mentioned, we'd like this study to be included in the Olympic Games Impact Study. We think that's the, the main audience that it's for. But it's also very useful for future build, building development at UBC. It's relevant to Vanoc and future Olympic host cities who might be looking to c conduct similar studies. Um, it's relevant really to all developers, engineers, architects and owners, anybody in building development. And finally, we think that it should be looked into by governments, policymakers, universities, and sporting bodies all throughout the world. Where can these, these uh, various audience members find our study? It's been published in the UBC SEEDS database. And to wrap up the introduction, I'd just like to say we believe that it's only when Decision makers start applying LCA to their buildings, they'll see real and measurable environmental performance results. So I'm going to pass it off to Sean now, who's going to take a look at the background of the study. All right, before we get into the heavier information and the numbers, I think it's important that we go over the background of the three buildings that we were going to study and our philosophy behind it. So the first building I want to talk to you about, uh, the Richmond Olympic Oval, which I'm sure everyone knows about, um, officially opened in December of 2008, and it was built to lead silver standards. Uh, during the Olympics, it maintained a 400 meter uh, skating oval, and it hosted all of the speed skating events. Um, its legacy phase is going to be, it's a general uh, athletic and um, conference area. The next is the Doug Mitchell Thunderbird Sports Center officially opened in July of 2008. This was also built to lead silver standards. Um, it was a renovation and reconstruction of the Thunderbird Winter Sports Complex on the original site. And what that means is that they tore down pretty much the entire original arena, save the Father Bauer Arena, and they rebuilt the new structure around it. Uh, during the Olympics, it hosted ice and sledge hockey events, and it's now home to the UBC Thunderbird hockey teams. Uh, the final one is the original Thunderbird Winter Sports Center. Uh, if you see the pictures, that's from the original building in 1963. Um, it was, like I said, originally opened in 1963 and later expanded in 1968 and 1969. Uh, in total, it included three full-size ice rinks, uh, curling arena, and also squash and handball courts. Um, interesting to note, uh, the building was home to the original Canada's first national hockey team. And the, like I said, the Father Bauer Arena was retained by the, by the new structure. Now, this presented an interesting problem by doing the new structure and the old structure. We had to come up with a philosophy for how we wanted to uh, allocate the impacts between the two structures. 
And what we decided was that whoever spent the money on the project would inherit those impacts, which comes to mean that the Father Bauer Arena, as it was um, monetarily, um, as it was paid for by the original, was going to be included in the original, and the demolition of the old building, since it was paid for by the new project, would be included in the impacts of the new project. And now I'll hand it off to Josh and we'll talk about methodology. Kenny had uh, outlined earlier in the intro, he went through, this is the broad view of how LCA would work. So you have your goal and scope, your inventory analysis, your impact assessment, and of course there's interpretations that are inherent with each of those steps. But I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail, break it down a little bit more, on how we actually did it. So we start off with the takeoffs. And the way that we do this is with software called on-screen takeoff. It was taught to us by Rob how to use. And we got the drawings supplied to us by three different sources. You can imagine three different buildings, three different sources. So for the old Thunderbird, we got that from the UBC Records Department. The new was uh, given to us by the architects, Casey Architects. And the oval was supplied to us by Canon Design with permission from the city of Richmond. So from there, <clears throat> I'll go into more details and further slides on how we actually did that. Uh, from those takeoffs, we, we found data. Uh, volumetric data from the materials and from different categories in the middle, not categories, but assemblies, sorry. And we input that into software called Xena Impact Estimator. And what that software does is it creates a bill of materials. <clears throat> we get the results from the bill of materials. Is this, next, this next one's a little bit of a tongue twister, but I promise we'll clarify it in further slides. But we take the results from the BOM, we get that with the Athena. Um, <laughs> this one's tough. This one is the life cycle inventory. So we have the Athena life cycle inventory, and that is characterized further by the tracing method, which we'll explain later. Um, and then that gives us an impact assessment profile, which is what we are here to show you today. And the assumptions boxes on the top there is just goes to show that through the process, those two first two steps is where we had to make a good portion of our assumptions, which we show in our study as well. Okay, so this here is a screenshot from uh, on-screen takeoff. And as you can see, that's a picture of the a plan view from the Father Bauer. And what I've got set up here is they, they're called conditions. You set up a condition, and that allows you to trace either area, count, or you can do linear. But here, we've got an area condition showing that this is like the surface area of, say, a rink, right? So we can find out using this, we can set the scale in the the software, and you can find out the total square footage there if you need it. Uh, you can also do a condition with counts if you have something that's repetitive within within the drawings. So in this example, we have footings. So the footings you you would define the geometry, and then you just click everywhere where it occurs in the drawing. Linear is useful for something like a wall or a strip footing, something that's linear in the drawing. So you define a thickness and a depth. And you just trace it along, and it will give you a volume. So from that, we get a bunch of data. This data then goes into the Xena Impact Estimator, and the inputs are also put into something called the Input, uh, input Assumption Document, which I'll go over later. Uh, we put that through the Athena Input, uh, the Athena input Impact Estimator, sorry, and that's used to generate the bill of materials. But just to clarify on the impact, um, the input, an assumptions document. We've got everything laid out for transparency for further studies because we want people to, if they look at this, they can see everything, all the assumptions we made. It's very clear. It also streamlines the process for putting everything in there because you get all these numbers and it's kind of hard to organize. So we use this spreadsheet and it really helps. And as you can see, everything is broken down into assemblies. So footings is an assembly, for example. Uh, mixed columns and beams would be another assembly. So you have all the input fields, and those are all the input fields you would have with Athena. So you see that second column there, input field. The measured column is what we got from, from here, or from our OST data. We put that in there, and when we have a dash, that indicates that we had to make an assumption. 